Number 10, X-Man. It's not a deadly superhero list without at least one Grey or Summers offspring making the cut. And X-Man is both, genetically speaking at least. X-Man is Nate Grey, who hails from the Age of Apocalypse reality of Earth 295. He is known as X-Man and is also sometimes referred to as Mutant Jesus. So I think you can imagine what we're working with here. Nate Grey was created by the Mr. Sinister of his reality using the genes of both Jean Grey and Scott Summers. He represents the greatest potential in terms of power for their offspring. But despite being created by Sinister using Grey and Summer genes, he was actually raised by AOA's Forge. Nate Grey is a reality warper and a mighty one at that. Reality warpers, especially stable ones like Nate, would be extremely dangerous to have in the MCU because they would be limitless in terms of what they could do. Especially Nate Grey, he is very much limitless. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd and you love when we talk about comics, be sure to let us know you love us by subscribing. And that way you don't miss out on any of our awesome content. Yay! It's a win win. Number nine, Amass. Amass is one of my favorite new mutants that I've met in the last little while. They appear in the current Marauders run that started this year in 2022 and is written by Steve Orlando. Amass was created by Orlando and Eleonora Carlini. This mutant is wild. We don't know that much about them yet, but what we do know is that they can basically combine mutant powers and mutants together. Hence their name of Amass, because they amass things. They hail from a hidden ancient civilization of mutants known as the Threshold that existed eons ago and which we are only now learning about in the comics. And this was actually said to be like the first ever mutants to have existed. As of Marauders issue number 9, we do not know this mutant's limitations yet when it comes to their powers. And so I could definitely see them being a character who could easily break the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If they are as powerful as I suspect they are. And I suspect they're probably pretty powerful. Number 8, Ex Nihilo. If we get Ex Nihilo in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it will probably mean the coming of the Builders, which would be a whole world destroying event. Worlds destroying actually, since they basically obliterated multiple planets in order to reset the universe and start again because of what they had learned about the coming incursions. Ex Nihilo was known as one of the Gardeners. He was created by the Builders, as were all the Gardeners. Their goal was to perfect species on planets and create life. Which sounds great, until you realize the level of power needed to do such a thing. Ex Nihilo could both create matter and manipulate time. Which is pretty crazy. Number seven, Ulysses. Ulysses is an inhuman superhero who created a lot of commotion as a result of his powers and, well, just existing. Ulysses was actually the central cause of Civil War II. His powers allowed him to get visions of possible futures. With it believed the more clear his visions became, the more likely these futures were to happen. As a result, the heroes became divided into two camps when it came to how to best utilize Ulysses and his immense power. One camp was headed by Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel, who hoped to utilize Ulysses' powers and visions to prevent tragic and devastating events before they happen, thereby saving countless lives, but of course at the cost of punishing people before they'd even really done anything wrong. Whereas Tony Stark's Iron Man headed the second camp of heroes, who weren't as willing to put all their faith in Ulysses' visions, especially at the cost of compromising the freedom of those who had possibly not even done anything wrong yet. If you'd like to avoid Civil War II from happening, a good way to do so would be by us never getting Ulysses in the MCU, which would create a lot of craziness. Number six, the Joker. The Joker and Harley Quinn have a long and complicated relationship. I mean, you know, Joker has been around a long time. And fun fact, Harley was actually just created during, you know, the animated TV show. But she became so popular that she was out of the comics. She was someone who was, you know, studying the Joker. And he ended up turning her into what she is today. Harley, though, has proved that she doesn't always need the Joker. I mean, she has had like her own comic series, movie, and even TV series. But the reason Joker's on this list is because he is partly responsible for turning her into what she is. And that is a very dangerous thing indeed. Number five, Blackfire. Blackfire is the older sister of Teen Titans member, Starfire. She has a ton of abilities like super strength, healing, stamina, etc. Basically almost all the powers of her sister, except flight. She once could fly but lost that ability due to a strange illness. Now, Blackfire became a big villain for the Titans and her story is super interesting. She was basically next in line for the throne but everyone kind of loved her younger sister more than her. I mean, Clearly, she was a bit unhinged because she became evil, but seeing everyone love your sister so much more than you doesn't really help that. Number four, Enchantress. I think a lot of people are a lot more familiar with Enchantress after 2016 Suicide Squad film. June Moon has the ability to turn into the sorceress known as Enchantress by simply saying Enchantress. She also has a wide array of abilities like teleportation, healing, flight, 
fire control, spells, and telepathy. She's one of the most powerful magic users that DC has. And she's also a little bit crazy, which makes her very unpredictable. And if someone is crazy and unpredictable with those abilities, whew, that makes her a dangerous and scary combination. Number three, Doomsday. I mean, the dude is just dangerous. Everyone knows it. I mean, he killed Superman, which not a lot of people can say. Now, the death of Superman's story, whether you like it or you hate it, is a big deal. It changed the comic world forever. A lot of people think for the worst because Superman ended up coming back, and then that opened the door for characters to die and just come back as many times as they want. Regardless, it was a massive success in terms of sales. Killing Superman was something that seemed impossible at that point. So the fact that Doomsday was actually able to do it just automatically makes him one of the most dangerous people in the whole universe. Number two, the Anti-Monitor. The dude that started the crisis on infinite Earths. One of the coolest comic crossover events in the history of comics. It was amazing. Not only did it take heroes from the main Earth to stop him, but multiple Earths. This event brought different versions of the characters we love into the fight and tried to save every world. Of course, it didn't work out perfectly for them. They ended up stopping the Anti-Monitor, but a lot of Earths were destroyed, and some merged together to make one. Just, you know, as a way to kind of simplify the DC continuity. The Anti-Monitor is just super dangerous and deserves to be high up on this list. There is actually a lot of debate as to who is more powerful, the Anti-Monitor or the next person on this list, which of course leads us to number one, Darkseid. This one is a no-brainer. Darkseid is basically more dangerous than everyone in the DC Universe. That is why he's so feared. When he shows up, it's an all-hands-on-deck kind of situation. Everyone needs to step up to stop him. I mean, just look at how many heroes and sometimes villains are needed to actually stop him. Superman is insanely powerful and has even been tossed around by Darkseid on multiple occasions. You can just throw him like he's playing with a toy. I mean, just look what he did to everyone during Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. It was crazy crazy cool. Hopefully, one of these days we can actually see him in live action. Oh man, that would just be the day. Seeing the Justice League take on Darkseid on the big screen. I just get chills even thinking about Number it. Number 10, Cable. Cable is not only dangerous to others he comes up against as a hero, but he's even dangerous to himself. Cable is a badass from the future who is taken there in his youth to protect him and ensure his survival. He has since made his way all across and through time and has even returned to the present from the future, which is his past. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of time travel stuff. It can get a little confusing. When Cable dies, it isn't even because anyone else took him out either, and he even saw it coming, because it turns out that his younger self was the one responsible, a version of the character we often refer to as Young Cable or Kid Cable. So yeah, Cable is deadly in the sense that he'll do whatever he needs to, even if it means ending his own time loop by killing his older self. Does that make sense? I hope what I said just made sense. I think it made sense. Number 9, Old Woman Laura. X-23's future self ends up in a much nicer alternate future reality than her genetic father Wolverine. Old Man Logan's reality? Wasteland, lots of death and people who have gone insane cannibalism. Old Woman Laura's reality? A sort of futuristic paradise where Kamala Khan ends up as president. But even still, her future isn't perfect. Because Laura is dying. Her genes have become unstable in her old age due to a flaw in the cloning process that made her not so good. The other thing that's not so good? Doom is holding the people of Latveria hostage and it's up to Laura to put a stop to it. This version of Laura from the future is just as deadly as her main continuity counterpart, but with added years of experience and is willing to do whatever it takes to defeat Doom, even if it means killing him and possibly sacrificing herself to do it. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you love time traveling as much as I love time traveling, click that like. Every time you click that like, there's a chance you could go back in time. That's not true, but wouldn't it be cool if when you clicked like on videos, you could time travel? That would be pretty cool. Number eight, Old Man Logan. Old Man Logan stays a hero in the future, but only because he doesn't have much other choice, really. Really, all Logan wants to do is live his life without having to think too much of all the deaths of his friends that he's responsible for. Logan in the alternate future of Earth 807128 ends up killing all of his fellow X-Men after being tricked into thinking they were all villains by Mysterio. Not only was he capable of causing all of that death, but further into the future, he goes up against a powerful and horrific villain in his time and reality, facing the head of the Hulk gang, and also sort of his landlord, Pappy Banner, aka Old Man Hulk. Something went wrong with Bruce Banner as time went on in this reality, and he basically lost his mind, likely as a result of that gamma radiation affecting him well into his elder years and not in a good way. Logan ends up being swallowed whole by Hulk, but defeats him in the end by cutting his way out of old man Hulk's gut. It's pretty gross. 
Number seven, Green Lantern. Jessica Cruz from Our Time might not be quite so dangerous yet, but when we glimpsed into her possible future in the Future State line from DC, we learned that there is a future version of her who becomes a Yellow Lantern, joining the Sinestro Corps. Not all Yellow Lanterns are bad, but because they are generally about instilling fear in others, they more often than not tend to end up becoming deadly supervillains and that's usually who they are. Jessica Cruz found herself stranded on a Green Lantern base and outpost without her powers, and when Sinestro Corps members showed up to investigate, found herself offered a Yellow Lantern ring after her fight against them had resulted in her overcoming her own fears and instilling fear into the hearts of her enemies. Which I'm not gonna lie, I really like that, that twist in the future for Jessica. I think Jessica as a Yellow Lantern is really cool. Number six, Powerhouse. Powerhouse is the codename for Franklin Richard the son of Susan Storm Richards, aka The Invisible Woman, and Reed Richards, aka Mr. Fantastic, both of the superhero team The Fantastic Four. When Franklin was just an infant, he caused a whole bunch of trouble due to being so powerful. In fact, he caused so much trouble that at one point Reed had to intervene by shutting down young Franklin's mind. At this point, Franklin was so powerful and his power so out of control that he could have easily and accidentally destroyed the Earth. And this is when Franklin was just basically a baby still. Franklin might not have his powers currently in the comics, but if we were to see Powerhouse at peak strength and power level, he would definitely be far too dangerous a character for the MCU. Number 5, Hyperion. Hyperion would be a challenging one I think to have in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, due to his similarity to one of the distinguished competition's main heroes, Superman. Hyperion is in essence like Marvel's response to a character like Superman, and he also recently appeared in the comics and was revealed to be problematic in his approach to heroics. That is to say through getting to know this version of him and this version of his team, the Squadron Supreme of America, that recently appeared in the comics during the recent Heroes Reborn 2021 event, we learned that these heroes were a lot more shady than our standard Earth 616 heroes that we're used to seeing on teams like the Avengers. That being said, this was an alternate version of Milton, but still I think a lot of problems would exist with trying to incorporate this character into the MCU. Number 4, One Above All. The One Above All isn't ranking lower because I consider them to be less powerful than those ranked above them on this list. I just feel like they might not be as great of a threat to the MCU if they were to appear. But still, they probably never should because they could kill the whole art of storytelling by becoming our deus ex machina plot device. One above all is basically the god of the Marvel Universe. And while it might be cool to see them appear as an allusion to the founders of Marvel Comics who made it what it is today, they definitely could easily derail plots or be used as a plot device to save the day but at the expense of cheapening the stakes of a story. That being said, they did appear in Immortal Hulk and I feel like that story actually utilized this character really well. So they could appear in a way that wouldn't cause harm to the universe or plots but it would still be a hard line to walk I think. Number 3, Sentry. The Sentry Sentry is a hero that might not only be too dangerous for the MCU, but also might be considered a little too dark as well when it comes to his origins. His danger levels though come from the fact that the Sentry not only has the power of like a ton of suns within him, but also the fact that within the Sentry lives the Void, the hero's alter ego who we initially thought was created by a split in his personality. But we would later learn in a retcon was an idea implanted in Sentry's mind thanks to the manipulations of villains. And mastermind. While Sentry might be the strongest hero this Earth has ever seen, the Void is definitely one of the most devastating villains as well. And they're usually a package deal. Not always, but usually. It's kind of what makes the Sentry interesting, so I think you gotta at least have the Void there to begin with. Number 2, Hope Summers. Hope has to be one of the most destructive superheroes that we could see in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. MCU mutants are coming eventually. Kamala Khan is already implied to be one of them as per the origin story her creators always wanted for her in the comics but got denied at the time of her creation due to the push of the Inhumans in comics as you know the rights to the X-Men and the mutants were all wonky due to Fox's involvement. But now the mutants are back with Marvel thanks to their partnership with Disney who acquired Fox and all is well. But not if we get mutants who then get erased from existence by House of M. Hope was originally known as the Mutant Messiah. She was the first mutant baby to have been born since House of M. 
and her powers put her on another level when it comes to heroics. She can take on the power of any other mutant in her vicinity, and get those powers at peak level and skill set. Add in the fact that Hope's birth also caused an all out war between the mutants during Messiah Complex, and yeah, having Hope in the MCU would both be challenging and be probably pretty dangerous. Number 1. Squirrel Girl Despite no longer being fully considered unbeatable thanks to a fight in the Fantastic Four where it's implied that Squirrel Girl was beaten off panel, Squirrel Girl still has beaten a lot of big names when it comes to villains in Marvel Comics, and has also helped to reform some major ones as well. In fact, this is kind of Dorian's like whole secret to success when it comes to beating her foes. She usually does so by befriending them and encouraging them to do and be better, which usually, you know, just defeats them by making them good people. She's inspirational, and hey, it's contagious. And while she has lost once, I think her track record of beating almost all villains she runs into makes her simply too dangerous for the MCU. I mean, almost no one would be able to stand against her. Doesn't matter who shows up, Thanos, Kang, she'd be like, look, why don't we just have a conversation and then it would all be resolved. Like Black Panther and What If when he was Star-Lord and he was like, I just had a conversation with Thanos and then we fixed it. Number 10. Scarecrow. While Scarecrow might not have any powers to speak of, his brilliant mind has granted him lots of tricks and abilities. One of the most well-known tactics of his is to use his fear toxin, which causes those exposed to have vivid hallucinations of their greatest fears. He also has a terrifying appearance and possesses some immunity to various toxins and poisons due to his exposure to chemicals. In the past, he has managed to use his fear toxin to attempt to poison all of Gotham, and and has more recently been busy terrorizing those outside of Gotham in Bloodhaven, including Dick Grayson, who he actually came quite close to defeating during his attempt to take over the city of Bloodhaven. Number 9. Black Mask While Black Mask might not be as popular as some of the others on the list, in some ways I would argue that he is more dangerous, especially when you are dealing with him one on one. Black Mask is a twisted sociopath who often tortures his foes who he manages to capture. He's not only played a supervillain to Bruce Wayne's Batman, but he's even even become a great supervillain to Batman's sometimes ally, Catwoman. In one story, he's responsible for torturing Selina Kyle's sister, Maggie, killing her husband, and forcing her to commit cannibalism by eating him, which ultimately drives Maggie insane. The feud between Black Mask and Catwoman became so intense that she eventually snapped, and even in one story was responsible for killing him. Number 8. Harley Quinn While Harley Quinn in the comic book world is ever more closer to the title of anti-hero in her new animated series, she set out to prove herself as the baddest bad guy ever, locking her sights on becoming an established member of the Legion of Doom. She wants to prove to not just herself that she can be just as evil and dangerous as the next villain, but also to her ex, the Joker. Harley wants the world to see her for who she is, bad to the core, and in the series she even manages to take on and win against the Joker, leaving Gotham on fire. But actually, with Batman MIA and possibly even presumed dead. Number 7, Bullseye. One of the best shots when it comes to the supervillain crowd. He can fire any weapon and throw anything, even teeth, and not miss. I even think he may have better aim than Hawkeye himself. I know, this is a controversial opinion, but. The two are at least on the same level for sure. Bullseye is also completely criminally insane. He kills without remorse and sometimes without even any interest in doing so. He's also the man responsible for killing two of Daredevil's loves of his life and has made Daredevil's life a living hell in more ways than just that. In the Netflix series, Kingpin hires this assassin to torment Daredevil just like in the comics. And in the show, Bullseye decides to go on a killing spree dressed as Daredevil to accomplish said task. He even managed to finally kill Matt Murdock during a final showdown with Daredevil in the miniseries End of Days. Number 6, The Fallen One. The Fallen One is a version of Norrin Rad who comes from a very dark future where Thanos wins. He first appeared in issue 15 of Thanos from 2016 in the Thanos Wins storyline. While he is pretty swiftly defeated, it is only because those he goes up against are even more deadly than him. And even then, it takes a few issues before the fight against him is actually concluded. So it's not like you're in, you're out. It's not a one and done. It's a few issues. Norrin Rad, aka the 
Silver Surfer became the Fallen One after he was imbued with black matter and also boasts, of course, of the power cosmic in addition to wielding Thor's hammer Mjolnir. He also comes leading the charge of the Annihilation Wave, so he's got a lot going on. He got all this power in the hopes of standing a chance in the final showdown with Thanos as one of the last beings left alive in the universe, one of the final people to actually fight him. Sadly, he does fail, but he still manages to look deadly and badass while doing so. So you gotta give him some points for that. Number five, Superman. John Kent in Future State takes up the mantle of Superman after his father. This also happens after his father left Earth and many of those who he helped believe that he actually has gone missing possibly to never return. That's what people think is going on with OG Superman. Well, we skip through the future timeline and future state with this version of John from this future being shown as a very heroic character. We also see some things that he does in this futuristic timeline that seem, well, not so heroic. Like when he bottled the city of Metropolis. John believed he had no other choice and that this was kind of the most peaceful solution to fixing the problems that the city faced at the time. However, he later is forced to confront the fact that he took away the freedom of the people of Metropolis when he made this choice for them. Future state John Kent is dangerous because he is willing to do whatever it takes to protect the city of Metropolis, which sometimes means taking actions that other heroes like Supergirl find questionable. Number four, King Thor. King Thor might be one of the most powerful future heroes on this list, but he also is only so deadly and dangerous because he's living in a time where he has to be. King Thor is the alternate future version of Thor from the alternate Earth of 14412. Here Thor goes on to become the Allfather and lives beyond the point where Midgard becomes a lifeless husk as a result of Thor's once more again villainous brother Loki, the god of mischief. At one point while battling Doom in the future, King Thor is granted the Phoenix Force by Logan, who is currently bonded to it at that time, and is able to use that power to defeat Doom. Considering that King Thor will do whatever it takes to defeat those who would oppose him, and considering how much power he wields, even when he doesn't have the Phoenix Force, I'd say he's a pretty dangerous future hero. I wouldn't want to go up against him. Number three, Cosmic Ghost Rider. I would say Cosmic Ghost Rider is one of the most dangerous heroes on this list because he's not entirely mentally stable, which also makes him a lot more unpredictable. Cosmic Ghost Rider was originally Frank Castle, AKA the Punisher. When Thanos attacked Earth, Frank made a deal with Mephisto following his death to become a spirit of vengeance, a ghost rider, so that he could return to Earth and get revenge on Thanos for all of the people on Earth that he had killed. However, by the time Frank returned to Earth, there was basically nothing left to avenge and Thanos had already left, leaving the planet empty and desolate. Frank wandered as a ghost rider for years and in his solitude lost his mind. He would go on to become a herald of Galactus in an attempt to defeat Thanos, but would eventually submit to being Thanos' herald after realizing that fighting against him was pretty pointless. Number two, Booster Gold. Booster Gold is demonstrably dangerous as a hero from the future, mainly because he has no idea what he's doing. He has tons of knowledge of what is meant to happen in the main continuity and present day that he traveled to from the future, but he has no idea of how messing with the past timeline or anything like that could affect the present day or its future. We see how dangerous he can be when he attempts to even do good, like saving Bruce's parents in the past so that they can be there for his wedding. Unfortunately, in doing so completely messes with the timeline to the point that Booster is actually forced to travel back in time and make sure that Bruce's parents are killed and that poor young Bruce is basically there to witness their deaths. It's also kind of implied that Booster being there and fixing all of that is actually what caused their deaths. It's pretty crazy, it's pretty trippy. Booster might have some valuable knowledge as someone from the future, but he doesn't have the finesse needed to know when the timeline can be tweaked and when it should be left alone to avoid catastrophes from manifesting in the future. Basically, do not let Booster time travel and mess with the timeline. It is not a good idea. <laughs> Number one, Iron Lad. Iron Lad is not specifically from the future, but he, he does go on to become a very dangerous villain who returns from the future. Iron Lad, who was a member of the Young Avengers, it turns out is actually destined to become Kang the Conqueror, who has many different villainous personas throughout the years. I won't go into them right now, but you know some of them. And he's also known for his time travel antics. He often travels back through to the past from the future to enact all kinds of elaborate, 
clots. As a Mortis, he had a hand in creating White Vision. Kang also at one point turns Iron Man evil, brainwashing him into becoming his loyal servant and villainous right-hand man. He's basically behind a lot of evil things that you're like, what is even happening here? And then it'll be like, haha, it was Kang the whole time. Possibly what we'll see in the MCU. I'm just, I'm placing my bets. Because sadly, I don't think I'm getting Norman Osborn in this phase. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Abra Kadabra. AKA Citizen Abra, he began his magical days as a Flash villain, first appearing in comics in the Flash issue 128. He's from the future, of course, like most of these guys are, but it's a future where, sadly, magic shows aren't a thing anymore. Yeah, sorry, David Blaine. Gotta get a new job. He's from the 64th century and technology has become so advanced that pulling a rabbit out of a hat just simply won't cut it anymore. I heard about the time machine powered by M-Metal, he just had to get his glittery magician hands on it. It was only capable of one trip, so Abra snuck into the laboratory and shot back in time to the 20th century where magicians were still celebrities, like Chris Angel or David Blaine or David Copperfield or, you know, the other ones. He would use technology from his timeline well beyond what we're capable of and then blow our minds in these magic shows. The shows were going well at first until people got bored, then they were actually more interested in this new statue being built in town, so we figured the next logical way of getting attention was to start stealing things, starting with this fancy new statue. He kept stealing, and he kept stealing after that, and he kept using his future tech to evade capture, so when it comes to magicians, Abracadabra is very committed to the craft, in the future or the past. Number nine. Gore, the God Butcher. The God Butcher will be played by Christian Bale in the upcoming Thor Love and Thunder sequel, and yes, he is a time-traveling menace as well. He made his first appearance in Thor God of Thunder issue two. He was born on a planet with no name, which is always a great sign. Gore lost his parents when he was very young, and he was told to pray to these gods, because they would always make things better, these glorious gods. And then after getting a wife and son, death kept looming over, and he lost both of them as well. Really tragic stuff. So now he's a little bit more than upset at these gods. He wants them to answer or to pay, one of the two. With the all black necrosword powers, he heads out for revenge on these gods, but in the past. He would use the pool of forever to travel back in time and make these attacks happen. He would use the pool of forever to go back in time and then attack all these gods when they were babies, right? So it took different versions of Thor from different timelines just to put a stop to Gore the God Butcher. So with this new Thor movie coming out, including Natalie Portman, Mjolnir, Lady Sif, I feel like it's gonna be a cosmic headache and do some time stuff in there as well. But in Taika, we trust. It's kind of like when Rhodey suggested getting rid of Thanos when he was younger by, you know, Gore the God Butcher is basically that mentality, but 10 times worse. And with powers. Number eight, Timothy Drake. The Red Robin, AKA Tim Drake, first entered comics in Batman 436. He was a young boy who saw the Flying Grayson show live in person. He even received kind words from Dick Grayson, and Dick dedicated that act to Tim that night. How lovely. Now, of course, this was moments before Dick's parents, John and Mary, tragically died during this act. A night Tim would never forget, especially when he witnessed the Cape Crusader himself, Batman Batman consoling Dick Grayson afterwards. So years later, when Tim was nine, it was Batman and Robin taking down the Penguin, and Robin did this quadruple somersault, the only flip that could be performed by a Grayson, and then he connected the dots. He's like, oh, so you're him, and you're him. Got it. Tim followed them around for a while, and then after Jason's death, Tim suited up himself as the third Robin. But in the Titans Tomorrow storyline, we see the Teen Titans travel to the 31st century to assist the Legion of Superheroes, and when they return, they accidentally end up 10 years in their future. So they meet older, darker future versions of themselves, including Timothy Drake, now going by Savior. This version of Tim is ruthless. He even carries around with him Joe Chill's gun to help get the job done. So when the team gets back to their real timeline, they swear to never become their dark counterparts, and they split up. But, like I said earlier, this split up is actually what ends up causing the dark versions of themselves to happen in the first place. Time! You can't mess with time. That's it. The Titans Tomorrow storyline is definitely one you need to check out. We love dark, evil versions of our heroes. We can't get enough of them. Number seven, Ultron. The Avengers Age of Ultron storyline is a lot better than the MCU's version of that. The comic Age of Ultron has better time travel stuff than the movie Endgame does, honestly. I mean, Wolverine goes back in time, he tries to kill Hank Pym so that Ultron's never created, but while he's there, he has to talk to other Avengers who are also back in time on a different mission. It's wild, it's a great time. It starts off with New York City in ruins. Spider-Man is zipping around the city, all these heroes are missing or they're dead, and the only way for the city to survive this apocalypse is by 
offering superheroes to Ultron, who just rules everything. So She-Hulk and Luke Cage are amongst these survivors, and they have the plans basically to just go in willingly, and then once they're inside, they're gonna break everything apart because they're super strong. But then when they get there, it's not even Ultron that's running the show, it's actually Vision. The Vision is being used as a conduit from future Ultron, so he's safe, you can't just go and punch him, and then everything's fine. He's in the future, he's safe, he knows what's gonna happen. It's, we're kind of screwed. We can't punch our way out of this. We have Ultron already on top. Ultron is actually barely in the story, funny enough, but the stakes start off raised, so you feel anxious the entire time reading it. It's a great time travel story. Definitely check it out. Number six, Kingpin. When it comes to the life of Matt Murdock and sometimes the life of other superheroes who get in his way, you can't go bigger than Kingpin. Wilson Fisk is so brilliant, so imposing, and so terrifying that he rules with an iron fist. Not the iron fist, just an iron fist. You know what I mean. And very few dare to cross him. He knew who Daredevil was for the longest time, but chose to keep his identity under wraps. That's how confident Fisk was that he didn't need to leak it in order to ruin Matt's life. In fact, Kingpin managed to figure out a lot of super secret identities, proving how well connected and sharp he is. He also prompted Peter into beating him within an inch of his life when it was revealed that he was the one responsible for an assassination attempt that landed Aunt May in the ICU. Savage. He paid for that one though. He definitely paid for that one. Number five, Ra's al Ghul, or Ra's al Ghul, depending on how you want to say it. Like Batman, Ra's al Ghul is very much a self made man. The biggest difference between the two is that Batman attempts to stand for justice, while Ra's al Ghul is a powerful criminal mastermind. In fact, he is one of the few who can rival Batman when it comes to all the skills and training that he has had, as well as his amassed knowledge over the years. Of course, Ra's has a lot more time to work on himself and become so skilled. And this is due to his use of the Lazarus Pits, which has helped him to stay eternally young, heal, and basically be considered immortal through their use. Of course, tons of people, superheroes and villains alike, have used the Lazarus Pits to come back to life or heal themselves throughout comic book history. And while some might think this means he has a superpower, it just he just has access to the Lazarus Pits. It's not it's not his power. He doesn't own it. I mean, he uses it the most, but other people come through. Number four, the Red Skull. A villain so evil, even the Joker didn't want to work alongside him during a crossover with Captain America and his sidekick Bucky and Batman and his sidekick Robin. Johann Smith's appearance might make you think that he has powers, but although he's stolen some powers a few times, for the most part, the most dangerous thing about him is just how evil he really is. His love of violence and murder began a long time ago, back when he was just a young boy in love. Johan was actually born into an abusive household and immediately was almost killed by his father, who attempted to drown him when he was just a newborn. Later in life, Schmidt became a runaway orphan and thief, who was later taken in by a Jewish shop owner. He and his daughter were the first people to really show Johan kindness. In defending them, he committed his first murder, and frustrated when the daughter did not seem to appreciate his help, he repaid their kindness by assaulting her and leaving both her and her father for dead. This was the moment that Johan first realized how very much murdering and causing pain to others brought him joy. And he also realized how much he cared about power. Number three, Ozymandias. Ozymandias is so skilled that he even makes you think he has superpowers. He's so brilliant, he figured out how to move quickly enough to catch and stop a bullet. Something that has only really been posed as possible in magic shows that pull off the trick using the typical tactics of distraction and sleight of hand, simply making it look like they caught a bullet while likely they just had a bullet on them the whole time, found a way to make you think that they caught it. But Adrian Veidt is so well studied, he's obviously discovered a way to pull off this trick in real life with real stakes. His superior intellect is what he relies on for everything, and in a sense, the way he manipulates people into doing what he wants almost appears just like a magic trick. He's able to think and plan so far ahead, distract those he targets so well that they never even think to suspect him. And in truth, unless he reveals his plot to you, you'll probably never even know that he was involved in what happened at all. Number two, Lex Luthor. In his efforts to destroy Superman, Lex has gone to great lengths. He's even successfully campaigned and been elected as president of the United States. Not only that, but his ire for soups is so strong that it has even extended to the Justice League as Lex was also the man who put together the Injustice League Unlimited crew, whose main aim was revealed to be world domination through coming together. Unfortunately, the villains weren't as good at working together as their heroic counterparts and eventually they were defeated. But even then, Lex claimed that he was so brilliant that even the destruction of the Injustice League Unlimited and his capture were all part of his master plan, apparently. 
Number one, Joker. Despite not having any powers, Joker remains one of the most iconic and dangerous villains of all time. While not all of his ideas have been winners, all of them have definitely been pretty creative. And while some of the more outlandish plots have flopped, Joker is still known for some of the most dastardly plots in all of comics. In the non-canon story Killing Joke, he was responsible for paralyzing Barbara Gordon in an attempt just to drive her father, Commissioner Gordon, insane. He is basically single-handedly responsible for Superman snapping and losing it in the Injustice universe. He killed Gordon's wife point blank after making her drop her weapon by tossing a baby at her. When Joker was Emperor Joker, he was responsible for devouring and thereby destroying the entire population of China. He killed and tortured various Robins, and some still believe he may have had involvement in the death of Bruce's parents. Joker is one of the most creative and disturbing villains around. He's sadistic, chaotic, and unpredictable, making him an insanely dangerous man to deal with, even when you are on his side. Thank you so much for watching, Nerd Squad. I hope you enjoyed this list. I just love how many powerful supervillains there are out there who rely on just their wits alone and sometimes additional gadget accessories to get things done. For my bonus content, I'd like to share with you an honorable mention that I have. Poison Ivy may be well known for her plant control powers, it's true, and the abilities to manipulate and control the minds of her victims. But just a friendly reminder that Pamela Isley hasn't always been known as deadly just because of her powers. Behind her, like many other good supervillains, there's a brilliant mind. In fact, in the Batman animated series, when we are first introduced to Pamela, it is her knowledge as a botanist and her insane passion for the environment that makes her so deadly. And this is all just in our first introduction to her in the show. Picking off the list at number 10, we have Weasel. He's one of those new additions to the team in the highly anticipated James Gunn soft reboot, but who exactly is the sketchy looking villain? All I know is that James Gunn's brother is doing the physical stuff for him, which is great. He did all the work for Rocket Raccoon and Guardians of the Galaxy, so it's gonna be fun. Whatever it is, it's gonna be fun, but who is this guy? Is he powerful? Is he evil? What's his deal? Well, he made his first debut back in Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 36. He made his mark at Stanford University working alongside Professor Martin Stein. Even before this happened, he wasn't liked by other students. He was deemed an unremarkable and unlikable man, and sadly was given the nickname Weasel. He wasn't a fan of this, obviously, it made him pretty insecure, so when he got hired as a teacher at Candermere University, he was easily fed up with the other faculty members as it was just those mean students grown up, so. Of course. So he viewed them as a threat, obviously, and he dressed up like this weasel character and started taking them out. He started attacking them one by one. Now, as far as Suicide Squad members go, this is one of the weaker ones pulled out of Bell Rave Penitentiary. But he is gonna be in the new film, so we gotta talk about him at least a little bit. He didn't last long in the comics either. His last issue was Doom Patrol and Suicide Squad Special Issue 1, where during a mission to rescue Hawk, Weasel took out the Thinker, who I'll mention later on in his list. And then when Rick Flagg put on the Thinker's helmet, the Thinker's last thought took over and Rick ended up being the one to take the weasel out. I'm pretty sure this is gonna happen in the movie, but if not, we're still happy. He appeared later on in the comics as well, but this was during the Blackest Night storyline when he was revived as a Black Lantern. And before we continue on with this list of Suicide Squad members, guys, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be great. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for your support. We're gonna get right back into the video. Let's go. Number nine, Bane. It's kind of hard to forget a villain like Bane. He's a big fan of, you know, breaking backs. And when you break the back of somebody like Batman, you're gonna have to be locked up away for probably a little while. Bane is a super smart villain and the steroid called Venom that's being pumped into his veins sure does help get the attention of the Suicide Squad. I mean, once you break the bat, that's a pretty good audition, I'd say. At the end of the series, Suicide Squad raised the flag. Amanda Waller recruited Bane to the Suicide Squad and we once again see Bane rocking the camel back of strength. He's got his Venom again, this time in Outsiders issue 50. The team makes their grand entrance and Bane right off the bat doesn't like following the instructions of leader Rick Flagg. Flagg says to just simply use the stun gun and Bane's like, nope, gonna do it my way. Thank you, sir. So it's no surprise when the team tricks Bane in Salvation Run issue two. See, they're assigned to ship villains to salvation by using boom tubes and Bane and Deadshot ended up being sent as well. Yeah, get that psycho out of here. Go, go break some other backs. Or don't break backs. How about that? Go back into jail. Number eight, Killer Croc. A face we saw in David Ayer's Suicide Squad, a face that's rather terrifying and a face you wouldn't really forget. Killer Croc, AKA Waylon Jones, made his first appearance in Detective Comics issue 523. He was born in Florida and faced a medical condition that, well, look at him, it turned him into a crocodile. When he was an adult, he began wrestling alligators at carnivals just to make ends meet, hence the name Killer Croc. That was his stage name. 
at first. But realizing crime was soon best for Wayland, he left the carnival and became one of Gotham's most feared criminals. He wasn't a member until the recent 2016 run of Suicide Squad, and he's like, okay, anything but space. I'll do the missions as long as it's not in space. First mission they go to, Space. Number seven, Outlaw. John Henry Martin made his first debut in Manhunter issue 16, but he did in fact join the Suicide Squad in issue 58 of the run from the early 90s. But where exactly did his villain journey start? Well, while John was serving time in prison, because that's how every supervillain starts in comics, this bomb called the Gene Bomb exploded and it gave him super strength and it allowed for him to be protected against attacks as well. He couldn't control his abilities well, but he did have these super abilities. He escaped prison, but he didn't get too far being, you know, unexperienced in his new abilities, so he alongside other Gene Bomb metahuman victims were put in Bell Rave prison, but they couldn't find any traces of these powers that he used, so they just had to send him back out to the first prison that he easily broke out of the first time around. And during the transportation to go back to that prison, he broke out near the Florida Georgia border, and then Bob's your own. Number six, Reverse Flash. Eobard Thawne made his debut in Flash issue 139, titled The Black Flash. He was the OG Reverse Flash. He was born in 2451 when his parents genetically engineered him because that's the thing you do in the future and you can engineer your kids to look and be funny and cute, I guess. Okay, cool. But he lacked the social skills in this time to make his parents truly proud. So they decided, you know what? Another son may be the key, a new best friend. Great idea, you know, they can pair up and talk and be friends and stuff. Okay, cool. I grew up with siblings, I get it. That second son's name was Robert. He spent so much time trying to keep an eye on Robert and to make his parents proud and to like babysit him that down the road, his application to study the Speed Force at the Flash Museum was rejected. He was too busy, couldn't even study. So he studied it illegally. <sighs> but he was caught by his brother who was now an officer in the science police. This guy is interesting and a little confusing. So a future version of Eobard traveled through time and prevented his brother from being born. And then he was able to study and was in turn this time around admitted to the Flash Museum. Great. But then when Professor Drake was on the verge of proving the existence of the Speed Force, Eobard has trained his whole life for this. So he wanted to collab, but Drake said no. He wanted to do it solo. So he traveled back in time again and eliminated Professor Drake from the equation. So next time around, there's no Drake, there's no problem. Now Eobard is the professor at the Flash Museum and was nicknamed Professor Zoom. Reverse Flash is responsible for the death of Barry Allen's mother and his wife, Iris West. He just rips timelines and the Flash's life to pieces. That's his whole thing. Number five, Maestro. In Avengers Endgame, we cut to five years in the future. Hulk is now smart, he's taking selfies, he's dabbing, he's hanging out with the team, but he's embarrassed by his past smashy version of himself from 2012's Avengers. We love growth, we love seeing a character change, but what if the Hulk had lived even longer on this planet? Well, that's where we get into the Incredible Hulk future and perfect storyline. As the title suggests, the future is not so bright here. There are no flying cars, there's actually nothing really there. It's not a paradise at all. When we see the future Earth 920, Zero, zero, we're seeing a Hulk 100 years in the future as well. We find him after a nuclear war put the planet close to extinction. So the Hulk, or rather the Maestro, was older, stronger, and scarier looking, all because he'd been absorbing all this nuclear radiation from the Earth. He became even more unstoppable and, of course, just super jaded, just super evil. He had to face a future version of Rick Jones at one point, and then he ended up losing a battle to said Smart Hulk as well. I wouldn't want to face any version of the Hulk at any time. I don't want to fight Smart Hulk, War Hulk, Horseman Hulk, or even Bruce Banner. I don't want to fight the scientist Bruce Banner. Number four, Time Trapper. First appearing in Adventure Comics 317, Time Trapper was introduced to readers as a warlord in the far future who prevents the Legion of Superheroes from traveling into their future with this iron curtain of time. The Time Trapper's main goal basically was to steal this weapon that could absorb every energy in the universe, just this Dyson vacuum full of energy called the Concentrator. Now the team caught wind of this Time Trapper when they could no longer jump more than 30 days in the future. They're like, okay, something's up. There's some higher powers preventing us from being badass. He resides comfortably at the end of time, accompanied by his servants, the Glorith of Baldur. Time Trapper can age anybody he wants, either a couple years or straight to the ashes and bones part. In Action Comics 385, Time Trapper created a temporal force barrier in order to seal a time traveling Superman away from the 20th century. He's that powerful. Number three, Bishop. Lucas Bishop is a time traveler from a dystopian future, and his goal is to travel back in time to stop his unknown factor amongst the X-Men. Okay, so he comes from this dark future and he goes back in time to change it because something bad happens. There's some bad mutant, okay? But this happens where most of the mutant population is depowered by the Scarlet Witch 
And then this one child, Hope, Hope Summers, was born, the first mutant born since M-Day. Well, it turns out that this kid is the reason Bishop is going back in time in the first place. This kid would end up taking millions of lives in the Six Second War. So Bishop thinks the only way to save his future is to travel back in time and take out Hope Summers as a child, but he fails at taking out Hope, but he does take down Cable, creating this new future where Cable is remembered as the hero for protecting the child, and Bishop was actually remembered as the villain. So he was the villain in his own story, and he didn't even know it. Number two, Kronos. If you do the crime, you're doing the time. But if you have enough time, you can plan said crime out in detail, then maybe you just won't get caught next time. David Clinton first entered DC Comics with the Atom issue three. He's mainly a villain for Ray Palmer, AKA the Atom. Now he was a criminal his entire life, and finally, when he was arrested, he was thrown in the slammer, where he had time to think about everything that he's done, all the reasons why he got caught, why his plans didn't work. But maybe he had a bit too much time. He reflected on his past crimes and what he would have done differently if he had planned it better. And then he used his skills and obsessions with timepieces to work nonstop in the prison workshop where he learned about clocks, time, the mechanisms within, he learned about everything. So when his sentence was finally up, he was released and then became a time traveling villain. He used all these time inspired weapons like an exploding hourglass, a wristwatch with blades instead of hands, and a device that could slow time down. Going by the new name Kronos, in the DC animated universe, Kronos used these devices to go back in time and steal rare relics from the past. At one point, he actually tried stealing a utility belt from the Justice League's watchtower, but but when he was interrupted, he made a break for it through the time vortex and Green Lantern, Batman, and Wonder Woman followed him back. Not this time, Kronos. Literally, not this time. Maybe the next one. And finally, number one, Kang. Kang the Conqueror. As Loki gets closer to wrapping up, we're starting to see some higher powers at play here. The Time Lords were just androids. Loki was banished to a realm full of other Lokis. We're not really sure who's calling the shots yet, but signs are pointing to Kang. Jonathan Majors is already set to play the time-traveling villain in the next Ant-Man film, so let's do a quick refresh on him. Kang the Conqueror, aka Nathaniel Richards, made his first appearance in Avengers issue 8 back in 1964. Kang has seen many centuries. He can travel through time and his futuristic suit of armor is built with weapons that can take on any superhero from any timeline that he chooses. He's super powerful and it sure helps when he travels with armies. That often does a trick. So he discovered time travel tech from the 31st century developed by Doctor Doom. And being being a descendant of Reed Richards with that brain power, he figured out a way to make it work to his advantage. He traveled back in time initially to become Pharaoh Ramatut, but once he returned to his 31st century, it was now just a wasteland. So he figured, okay, now I'm going to go all the way back and just rule Earth to prevent said destruction from happening. I feel like Kang is one episode away. We're so close. I can feel it in my soul. Kicking off the list at number 10, Slipknot. Yeah, so he was in David Ayer's Suicide Squad, but he didn't last long. I think he was in the movie for 46 seconds, maybe longer. It felt like 46. He got robbed. He's actually really cool in the comics. He's a mercenary who can climb anything. He uses his trusty ropes and grappling hooks, and being a formidable assassin, he should have probably survived longer in that movie. He joined the team in Fury of Firestorm versus the Suicide Squad. In the comics, he and Captain Boomerang believed that the bombs Waller had strapped to their arms were fake just like in the movie. So Slipknot tried to make a run for it, and in doing so, he got his arm blown to smithereens. And at that point, Captain Boomerang was like, mm, okay, maybe they're real, maybe they're real. Okay, I believe you. And before we continue on with this list of powerful Suicide Squad members, guys, if you wanna go ahead and hit that thumbs up, because it really does help us out quite a bit here at our studio. You guys are the best, thank you so much. Now let's get right back to the list. Number nine. Tatsu Yamashiro was a member of David Ayer's Suicide Squad, and she made her comic book debut in The Brave and the Bold, issue 200. She's a skilled martial artist who wields the Soul Taker sword, which sounds as cool as it is. Her husband's soul is actually one of the many that are trapped inside said sword. She trained as a samurai under Master Tadishi, and then she suited up and headed to America to join the fight for justice. She joined the Suicide Squad in Volume 5, issue 27. Other than being a powerful member of the squad, she's also been a key member of The Outsiders. Number eight, Blockbuster. This absolute unit entered Detective Comics in 1965, issue 345. Mark Desmond was kind of a Bruce Banner situation. Kind of. He was a brilliant scientist who felt like he was too scrawny. Yeah, he wanted to become stronger. He wanted to be bigger. He wanted to get ripped and Sarah's discovery wasn't cutting it. So what did he do? He created a serum that just made him strong because that's what you do in comics. He got super strength, but unfortunately the serum side effects resulted in him being a mindless brute. 
and he no longer was capable of talking as well. He was part of the Suicide Squad in the comics, but again, not for long. One of those characters that was cut too short. In Legends issue 3, Task Force X is sent to Mount Rushmore to take out Brimstone, but Brimstone actually used his fire powers against Blockbuster, and Muscles versus Fire, usually Fire is gonna win that battle. Muscles versus Fire, Fire is probably gonna win nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten, definitely. So that was Blockbuster's last appearance, short and sweet. Number seven, El Diablo. This was a key member in the climax of David Ayer's Suicide Squad, Cheto Santana. He joined the team in 2011 with the new 52's version of the Suicide Squad. And his powers, well, yeah, you probably guessed it, similar to that fire guy I was just talking about. He has the powers of pyrokinesis, and when he uses up all of his power, like we saw on the big screen, he can become much larger. He grows wings too. He straight up becomes a fire demon. How scary is that? Now, he's got quite the temper. Back before his Suicide Squad days were even upon him, he burned down an entire building just to settle a score with a gang. But then when he realized that innocent people were involved, obviously he turned himself in. So he's trying, you know? Number six, Adam Smasher. He's the grandson of the supervillain Cyclotron, so you already know he's gonna be a hard time. Meet Albert Rothstein. He made his comic book debut at All-Star Squadron issue 25, and his powers were passed down. Those powers being pretty spectacular. He can control the size of his body. He can change his molecular structure, and he was also the godson of the Golden Age version of the Atom, Al Pratt. In 52, issue 24, Amanda Waller recruits Adam Smasher to go against Black Adam. He actually recruits the squad himself, where he brings on Count Vertigo, Electrocutioner, Persuader, Plastique, and Captain Boomerang 2. Number five, Captain Boomerang. Okay, so I mentioned Captain Boomerang 2, but we gotta talk about the original, the OG Captain Boomerang. We saw him in the first Suicide Squad movie played by Jai Courtney, and he made his first appearance back in The Flash, issue 117. George Harkness was originally a Flash villain, and if you can take on the fastest man alive, you've got a pretty good resume. So far, so good. His skill set shouldn't shock you, given his name, Captain Boomerang. He was the son of an American toy maker, and he created these special boomerangs that helped him get into trouble, alongside his pal, Mick Wentworth. Nothing more intimidating than a guy with boomerangs, okay? So of course, Amanda Waller had to recruit this wacky villain, in exchange for a pardon and a prison release, of course. He was sent in to attack Britain stone at Mount Rushmore. I'm excited to see James Gunn's version of Captain Boomerang. He's said to be more or so the same as his version from the last one, but we'll see. He might have a little flashier outfit. I'm okay with that. Number four, Kimo. He made his first debut at Showcase issue 39 in a story called The Deathless Doom. Now, the scientist kept failing one experiment after another, but he kept working. He was dedicated to the cause. For science, people, science. So Kimo was not the name of a scientist. No, the scientist's name was Ramsey Norton. Kimo would be an awful name for a scientist. Kimo was the name he had given this plastic vessel to store all these chemicals after the experiments had failed. Big old vat of yuck. So when he finally added some failed growth formula to the mix, this vat came to life. This toxic creation who kept the name Kimo, of course. He ended up taking out the poor scientist that had created him, which is right off the bat, truly evil stuff. I feel bad for Kimo though, I'll be honest, because he didn't find out he wasn't a living thing until Supergirl told him in Supergirl Volume 4, Issue 5. She told him he's just a collection of chemicals and he was so upset he dispersed himself in the atmosphere and then it rained. In Adventures of Superman, he did join the Suicide Squad briefly in Issue 593. He worked alongside Manchester Black, Plasmus, and Shrapnel and their plan was to take out Superman. Number three, The Thinker. He made his first debut in The Flash Issue 12 back in the 40s and he's been around for quite a while. And while his alias doesn't sound too intimidating, Clifford DeVoe is not one you want to mess around with. We can see him in the trailers for James Gunn's Suicide Squad, and I feel like he'll be around in the movie for quite a while. It seems like he's in a quite a good amount of shots. He began his life as Keystone City's district attorney back in 1913, but his life changed when he joined mob boss Norvac one night when he was intoxicated. Just one of those decisions you make when you're drunk and you're like, well, I guess I'm just gonna roll with it. He offered his skills, well, his services rather, as a thinker, a preparer of alibis and legal precedents in order to keep bad guys out of jail. So Novak was like, score, we could definitely use you on our team. Let's go, here's a house, enjoy. So Novak was later on tricked by the thinker himself when he shot at a reflection in a steel mirror, which caused the bullet to ricochet and then hit himself. So the thinker wasn't even involved in this case. He had nothing to do with it, really. He got on the Flash's naughty list, but when the thinker developed the thinking cap, it allowed him to 
project mental force upon his enemies. So he's got the brains and power to take down many foes. He accepted a mission with the Suicide Squad in order to get a full pardon, where he was seemingly taken out by the weasel of all people. But in reality, he survived because he's smarter than that. He's a thinker. He actually went on to become friends with Jay Garrick. And you know what? We love a change of heart. Number two, Peacemaker. John Cena himself is making his debut as Peacemaker in James Gunn's Suicide Squad, but he's also getting his own spin-off series. How exciting is this? When he was first asked about the role during DC fandom, Cena himself compared the character to a terrible cocky Captain America, which sounds about right. So Christopher Smith showed up early in comics with the Fighting Five issue 40. That was when he was with Charlton Comics. He was part of a paramilitary force that kept the world safe. I mean, he didn't even carry weapons that could cause bodily harm. That's how much he meant well. But then after Crisis on Infinite Earths, he entered DC Comics with the same name, only now he has no problem taking out bad guys, all while spreading peace and love. So the guy's a maniac, basically. To be honest, I could probably watch this guy for an entire season of a show. Definitely, John Cena is great. He's so funny and he's also so ripped and humongous and terrifying. So it's gonna be a good time. And finally, number one. Killer Frost. Louise Lincoln, AKA Killer Frost. She's actually the second Killer Frost in the comics, but she made her debut with Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 21. She was actually a friend and coworker of the previous Killer Frost. But after that Frost had passed away, somebody had to step up, right? So she repeated the same experiment and voila, we have a new and improved Killer Frost. She immediately went after Firestorm because, you know, they were to blame for the death of the previous Frost, which is always great when we have a villain do a nice grudgy start like that. She ended up selling her soul to Neron for more power. So it's safe to say you want to keep your distance with this one. She joined the Suicide Squad briefly in the comics, and she was also a key member in the animated Suicide Squad film, Hell to Pain. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Rick Flagg. Played by Joel Kinnaman, Rick Flagg was in the 2016 Suicide Squad film, directed by David Ayer, and it wasn't received well by the public, so much so that fans have been petitioning for a release of the hashtag Ayer Cut. But that's, uh, yeah, it's not gonna happen, I don't think. But we do get another shot with our loved characters. This time around, Rick Flagg looks even more badass. Rick Flagg is an elite soldier and government agent who works for Task Force X. So like we see in the film adaptation, Rick is the leader of the first Suicide Squad. Yes, there are more than one, which I'll get into later. Amanda Waller enlisted him when she created the Suicide Squad, which is a task force made of supervillains who take on these high-risk missions in order to get parole, reduce sentences, freedom, something glorious, something to look forward to, to use their abilities in a good way, or some kind of good way. He made his first comic book debut in the Brave and the Bold issue 25, titled The Three Waves of Doom. And we're looking forward to seeing James Gunn version of him come August 4th. The third wave of doom. Sounds familiar up here in Canada, hence why I'm in my apartment. And before we continue with some other dangerous Suicide Squad members, guys, that like button needs some love right now. You can feel it, I don't know, it's right there. It wants a little So if you wanna go ahead and click that, it helps our studio out quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Now let's get right back into this list. I don't wanna to waste too much every time. Number nine, Bloodsport. Idris Elba is making the jump from a major Marvel character to a major Superman villain. That's right, Bloodsport. He made his first comic book debut back in Superman Volume 2, Issue 14, and the first Bloodsport, there's of course more than one, that's how these things go, classic comic book villains, but the first one was Robert Dubois. Robert got drafted as a young man, but instead fled to Canada, and his brother had to take his place instead. Now his brother Mickey ended up losing his arm and legs when he got drafted, so Robert was a little messed up after carrying that guilt with him. So much so that he spent the next 12 years going back and forth between psychiatric hospitals. That is until Lex Luthor found him and used him as a way to take down Superman. He gave Robert this device that could teleport any weapon to him, and one of them of course being a gun that fires needles of kryptonite. So they used his guilt and made him into one of the most feared members. Whatever version of this character we get in the James Gunn film, I'm sure it will be a blast. Pun intended. Number eight, King Shark. And? Yes, that is your hand. Very good. Yeah, it's kind of hard to miss that guy in the trailer because, you know, he's a shark. We have a shark now. Great. Who's this shark guy? What's going on? Is it Left Shark? Well, he made his comic book debut back in Superboy Volume 4. He was born in Hawaii and he's a humanoid shark which I probably didn't need to point out, but his father is the king of all sharks, literally referred to as the shark god. So he was responsible for a few missing persons case, of course, being a hungry shark living in Hawaii and all, and it took a combination of heavy weaponry and sheer luck just to bring him in. Sam Makoa was the one who had to bring him in as well. What a unlucky ship. And several officers were actually taken out during this, so it was quite a mess. Now, as far as his origins go, for the Suicide Squad movie, they could go either way. 
because his sharkness is rumored to come from a variety of sources. He says his dad is a shark god, but others have said he's just a wild man, which is a race of humanoid animals, and the government thinks he's just a savage mutation from an experiment gone wrong. Either way, He's kind of cute and he's a shark, so I love him. Number seven, Parasite. Rudolph Rudy Jones. He made his first appearance in Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 58, and he started off as a janitor at the Pittsburgh branch of Star Labs. But like anything else that happens at Star Labs, his life was soon changed forever because there was an accident. Well, not really an accident, but while nobody was around, Darkseid turned Rudy into this new version of the Parasite. See, he had existed before Crisis on Infinite Earths, but then that's when Maxwell Jensen was Parasite, so. Darkseid controlled him, made him open a waste container, and then he was exposed to this radiation that turned him into this new green skin, well, Parasite, of course. So now Rudy has the ability to absorb all the life out of others, leaving just a skeleton sitting there behind. How gross would that be to find on a bus? Now his own body constantly needs to consume more and more or else he won't be able to survive. Hungry, hungry parasite, what a menace. Number six, Black Manta. David Hyde, most would recognize as a major Aquaman villain, AKA Black Manta. The most recent incarnation of the villain was introduced in Aquaman Volume 7, Issue 7. He grew up on a houseboat, excelling in diving and treasure hunting, and his parents were divorced and he stuck with his father, Jesse Hyde. Cause yeah, treasure hunting beats pretty much whatever's going on on mom's side. Sorry. They were looking for the Black Pearl, which wasn't a ship with Johnny Depp drunk aboard, rather it was a pearl that granted its users hydrokinetic abilities. And in Teen Titans Volume 6, Issue 10, David found that pearl. He later joined the squad in Volume 4 when he thought Aquaman had perished, because he figured, well, nothing better to do, might as well just join this team and do some, some villain stuff. Number 5, Mind Boggler. First appearing in Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 29, Leia Wasserman is a punk rocker who just happens to have been given powers by Breathtaker of the Assassination Bureau. Those powers being mind control, and she's actually really, really good at it. Her name is Mind Boggler, so she must be, right? She can make the walls seem like they're closing in, resulting in her victim to suffer a loss of equilibrium that they just instantly feel nauseous. Hey, it's Mind Boggler. Yeah. <laughs> One sec. She was on the Suicide Squad, but Captain Boomerang let her get riddled with bullets. You know, because she humiliated him for harassing another member. So yeah, Captain Boomerang's kind of the worst. Number four, Mr. 104. Not to be confused with Mr. 305, although they are very similar. We now go to Doom Patrol and Suicide Squad special. He's originally a Doom Patrol villain, but they all teamed up to rescue Hawk in Nicaragua. So I had to include this guy because, well, he would be much different now if he came around in the comics or the movies. Mr. 104 can transform his body into any of the elements. See, back then there were only 104. Now this dude could have transformed into 118 or whatever the number is. Unfortunately, his time as a Suicide Squad member was cut short while they were fighting the Rocket Red Brigade. Number three, Punch and Jewelie. A two for one combo coming right at you. Okay. So this criminal duo made their first appearance in Secret Origins Volume 2, Issue 28, and they're not taken seriously by most, but they've been known to be just as unpredictable as the Joker and Harley Quinn. See, Julie grew up in Brooklyn with Punch and they worked as puppeteers at Coney Island during the day, which sounds like a blast. But at nighttime, the couple drifts into the shadows and they become thieves. They came across a container filled with alien weaponry and they used it to create this underground base in Coney Island. And their criminal super career was born. They were recruited by the Suicide Squad in issue 24 of Ostrander's run in the 80s, but they left when a pregnancy came into the picture. Probably a good time to quit a Suicide Squad. I'd agree on that departure for sure. Number two, Captain Cold. Leonard Snart made his debut in Showcase issue eight. Now, Leonard enjoyed the company of his grandfather who ran an ice cream truck but after he passed away, Leonard had to just spend his remaining days with his father, who was just a terrible parent all around. So this led to Leonard joining a group of thieves, but he was caught by the Flash. See, originally he was a Flash villain. So next he studied the energy emissions of a cyclotron and figured, hmm, maybe it could work against this Flash guy. So he designed a weapon that could freeze people using the moisture in the air. Frozone style. And then he later on joined the squad in issue 17. I would be pretty pumped to see Captain Cold in live action. I feel like we need an evil Frozone on the big screen, that's for sure. And finally coming in at number one, Poison Ivy. Pamela Isley, there we go. She joined the team in issue 33. She actually stuck around for quite a while. She made her comic book debut way back earlier in Batman issue 181. She studied botany in Seattle, and after she was poisoned from special herbs, she got these fantastic abilities, and now she's invulnerable to all these poisons 
and after spending some time in prison after run-ins with the bat, she was recruited to the Suicide Squad. Like I said, she stuck around for quite a while. She helped the team out from issues 33 to 66. Now around the same time, she was also spreading deadly toxins around Gotham City in hopes that the only remaining citizens would be those naturally immune. So yeah, she's kind of a big bad deal. Number 10, Poison Ivy. Pamela Isley was a biochemist who eventually ended up becoming the superpowered villain known as Poison Ivy. She is one of Batman's recurring villains, although they have teamed up from time to time. It happens. But aside from that, Poison Ivy is just very powerful. She's immune to almost all forms of toxins and poisons. She can also just poison people with plants or even just from her skin. Like if someone comes in contact with her, she can poison them with just a touch. Pamela can also control all forms of plant life, making them do whatever she wants. Which, I mean, if you're in a forest or a jungle, or heck, even a greenhouse, that would just be a really dangerous place to be. Number nine, Catwoman. Selena Kyle is someone that even Batman can't seem to figure out. She consistently goes back and forth between the good side and the bad side. I mean, she even knows how to mess with Batman, who people call the world's greatest detective. Now, aside from that, she's also a very, very skilled fighter. She has taken on people with powers in one, and even, you know, she's even give Batman a run for his money. No one can predict what she's going to do. And with everything else that's been mentioned, instantly makes her super dangerous. Number eight, Reverse Flash. Speedsters are just dangerous in general. Luckily, there are a lot of good ones, like The Flash. But there are also a lot of bad ones, like Reverse Flash, AKA Eobarthon. Speedsters can not only just run super fast, but they can travel to alternate Earths or even back or forward in time. Now, if a non-speedster gets into a fight with a speedster, it usually doesn't end well for the non-powered person. Although, there are instances where someone with no powers has actually beaten one, but it's very rare. And Eobard is super freaking scary and is also thinking 10 steps ahead of everyone. Number 7, Talia Al Ghul. Talia is the daughter of Ra's al Ghul, or if you call him Ra's al Ghul, and has a long time on and off again relationship with Bruce Wayne, aka Batman. I mean, they even have son together, Damien Wayne. But back to my main point, Talia is one of the most dangerous people in DC. And she doesn't even have any powers. She's just incredibly skilled, and not only in fighting, but manipulation. She's great at getting what she wants. And back to the fighting aspect, she was trained by Roz or Raish, and that automatically shows how good she is. I mean, she can hold her own against all the best fighters in DC. And if she were to go up against Harley, Talia would have no problem taking her down. Number six, Bronze Tiger. Ben Turner is one of the best when it comes to martial arts. He actually is the best. He studied with Richard Dragon under the O Sensei, but was later brainwashed by the League of Assassins. So we have a great fighter, and then just like that, we have a well-trained fighter on their team. Awesome, that was sick. What's the point of that? He's one of the coolest members because he doesn't have powers, which is amazing, and I had to include him in this list. He's just that good at fighting. He has quick reflexes, and he's mastered pretty much every style of fighting. Be it boxing, jiu-jitsu, karate, muay thai, taekwondo, you name it, he can break your arms in so many ways. I think that's a better way of putting it. His chai manipulation ability certainly does come in handy, though. He uses this to enhance his concentration and heal quicker. In Suicide Squad issue 7, Bronze Tiger is actually able to defeat the speedster Bull Shoy. So no powers, but he can still take out a speedster. That's pretty impressive. Number 5, Windfall. Wendy Jones, a former member of the Masters of Disaster, made her DC debut back in Batman in The Outsiders issue 9. Now, she got her powers originally after her mother let her company perform DNA experiments on Wendy and her sister Becky. It was so awful what they went through that Becky actually took out her own mother later in life because of this. She was not happy and she carried a lot of guilt. So her and her sister were once part of the Masters of Disaster, but while Wendy was in school later on, these frat guys assaulted her, to say the least, just awful human beings, and one of those jerks' father was the local district attorney, and he refused to make a case for her when she reported it because of her past as a supervillain. Although his own son is a piece of shit monster. For sure, that makes sense, good logic. Now the college actually kicked Wendy out for this whole scandal, scandal. So Wendy returned later to the college and got some good old fashioned revenge, suffocating that same fraternity by removing the air from their house. So after she was put in Bell Rave Penitentiary, then that's when Amanda recruited her for the Suicide Squad. Number four, Count Vertigo. The villain that makes you puke. Werner Vertigo made his first debut in World's Finest issue 251 and he comes from the Vladivan royal family. And like his name gives away, his superpower is 
pretty unique and kind of gross. He makes his enemies disoriented, okay? So he started off by going against Black Canary and Green Arrow, but eventually he made his way to the Suicide Squad. Now, his initial plan before the Suicide Squad was quite simple. He went to Star City to steal back some jewels that his parents had sold when they escaped to England after the war. So he was born with an inner ear problem that affected his balance. So he had a device that helped out planted in the right side of his temple. Now, after messing around with the device, which is something you don't do with any device near your temple, he realized that he had the ability to distort others' perception. Now, it was so bad that they couldn't tell which way was up or down. So he ended up on the naughty list, of course but he accepted an offer to join the Suicide Squad in order to get his prison sentence reduced. Number three, Deadshot. Played by the Fresh Prince himself, Will Smith, in the other Suicide Squad movie, Deadshot, AKA Floyd Lawton, made his first comic book debut in Batman issue 59. His origin stories are pretty dark, okay? So his parents were both wealthy and they idolized his older brother, Edward, a lot. Now his father was unfaithful, so his mother actually asked her two sons to take him out. That's terrible. So Edward locked Floyd in the boathouse because Floyd wanted to go and at least warn his father, you know, tell him what was going on. So Floyd broke out and he grabbed a hunting rifle where he climbed a tree and saw that his brother had already shot his father. He wasn't dead, but he was paralyzed after the first shot. But then when Edward was preparing to take another shot to end him, Floyd aimed his rifle and shot at him. Now, Floyd meant to disarm him. He meant to, but the branch that he was on had snapped at the last second. So that bullet actually went through the middle of his eyes, which uh, dished out a lot more more damage than he intended to. So he took out the brother he loved to protect the father that he hated. That sounds just like a DC villain, if you ask me. So after that point, he was trained by David Kane to become the professional assassin we now know as Deadshot. Number two, Enchantress, AKA June Moon. She made her first debut back in Strange Adventures issue 187 back in 1966, where right at the top it says, meet the switcheroo witcheroo, the Enchantress. Now it sounds fun, but she's actually a nightmare. She of course is a member of the Suicide Squad and Cara Delevingne played her in the first movie, but in the comics her origins are pretty tragic. See, June Moon was a freelance artist who was dating this guy named Alan Dell. Dell invited her out one evening to a party at the haunted Terror Castle, which sounds like a good time for sure. But while she was there, she fell into a chamber with this being named Zaymor, which granted her witch powers. So now every time she says the name Enchantress, she changes into a green-eyed, powerful Enchantress. The downside is whenever June uses these enchantress abilities and creates magic too quickly, her personality becomes volatile and evil, which explains how she dips into the villain role. And finally, number one, Amanda Waller. I have to cap this list off with the boss lady herself. She made her debut in DC Comics with Legends issue one, and she was a powerful political figure who has been in many law enforcement agencies. They referred to her as the wall because of how aggressive and stubborn she is. She rebuilt Task Force X with Rick Flagg assigned to work under her, who I mentioned at the beginning of this list. And eventually she revived the Suicide Squad under her own direction. She's a great character. I mean, Suicide Squad issue 10 was titled Up Against the Wall. It is a fan favorite with her. Many fans have pointed out that this was the issue where we had the biggest change of pace and it stepped it up for the Suicide Squad quite a bit. It's this epic story that puts the Dark Knight himself against Amanda Waller. So in this issue, Batman discovers the existence of the Suicide Squad, and his next step of action is to threaten Amanda and say that he's gonna blow the whistle on the whole operation, but Amanda doesn't handle that offer too well because, well, she's the wall. She explains back to Batman that if he does this, she will use everything in her power to find out who he is and expose him. See, because he used his Matches Malone cover, he wasn't wearing gloves. So when he first investigated Bell Rave Penitentiary, no gloves means fingerprints. So that threat is not a bad threat at all, Amanda Waller. No powers and you're calling the shots. You're number one in my books.